Now, I can understand, Mr. Speaker, in, in the raucous that occurred yesterday in the House that you may not have personally heard the comment, I withdraw, but that doesn't excuse the fact that somebody had gone into the blues and edited out those comments to appear in the official answer. And that undermines our freedom of speech here as well as our privilege as parliamentarians. And that is, in my opinion, has done with intent and is definitely a contempt of parliament. <laughs> Holy smokes, do we have a good one today. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. For today's video, we're actually going to be going back a few days to when the whole kerfuffle happened with the wacko comments and more specifically the interaction between Greg Fergus and Rachel Thomas, which happened before Pierre Polyev getting kicked out. Now, the reason we're going back there is because yesterday, Rachel Thomas brought it up that she was wrongfully kicked out by the chair. When she made her comment, she actually said that she withdrew it, but he still went ahead and kicked her out. But there's a little bit more of a scandal that's underneath it all, and I'm going to be playing what she said in her speech now. Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of privilege today regarding a significant discrepancy between what was published in the Blues and what was published in Hansard of yesterday. The question of privilege that I raise also has to do with how I was treated by the Speaker of this House and how I was further portrayed publicly. The discrepancy between the Blues and what was published in the Hansard is the omission of two words, two very important documented words. An exchange between the speaker and me during question period yesterday. The Blues recorded the following statement by the speaker. I quote directly. If the Honourable Member for Lethbridge has problems with the chair, she should challenge the chair in a respectful way. But as the Honourable Member knows, challenging the chair is against the rules of this House. I ask the Honourable Member to please withdraw her remarks. To which I replied and rose in my space to say this, quote, Mr. Speaker, I stated that the chair is acting in a disgraceful manner. I withdraw. In the Hansard recording, two words are missing. The words, I withdraw. Wow. That said, it should be noted that it is reported in Hansard that at least one member did point out to the speaker that these words, in fact, were spoken. It says under the heading, an honourable other member, it says the following, quote, she withdrew it. In the audio recording, many other members were heard drawing attention to this fact, asking for the speaker to do the same. Now, before we get back to the rest of her speech, which is brilliant, um, I myself went back to see if I could actually hear her saying this because I must have missed it yesterday during the whole kerfuffle myself. And yes, it's true. You can actually hear her say, I withdraw as she's sitting down. Now, after Ferguson has his long pause talking to the middle chairperson and then coming back with his ruling to kick her out, you actually can also hear the other members uh, closest to him saying, but she withdrew, she withdrew. And I'm going to play that clip now here and just try to see if you can hear it as well. I'm, I'm going to ask the honorable member from Lethbridge if she has problems with the chair that she should challenge the chair in a way. But as she knows... As the Honourable Member from Lethbridge knows that by challenging the chair is against the rules of this House. I'll ask the Honourable Member to please to ask her to withdraw her remarks. I'm going to ask you, will you... Ms. Harder, I have to name you for disregarding the authority of the chair. Pursuant to authority granted to me by Standing Order 11, I order you to withdraw from the House and from any participation by video conference for the remainder of this day's sitting. Now, hopefully you guys were able to hear that. I know the audio for us was a little bit stacked with uh, noise, but as Greg being the chair, sitting so close... Even if he didn't hear Rachel say it, he had to have heard the other members say, but she withdrew, who I believe was James Bazan, the gentleman from the beginning clip. Him and a few others were kept saying, but she withdrew, she withdrew. So even if he didn't hear Rachel, he had to have at least heard them, and he just decided to ignore it. 
But this now leads to the rest of Rachel's speech, which it leads to some foul play. These words, Mr. Speaker, are significant because they demonstrate that I complied with the Speaker, your request to withdraw. It demonstrates that my withdrawal was not conditional, but rather it was proper and textbook. Therefore, it ought to have been accepted. Yet, I was kicked out of this place for the remainder of the day, as if I hadn't withdrawn those words, or to put it another way, as if Hansard recording of the event was accurate and true, when in fact, Mr. Speaker, we know it is not. If you were to check the audio recording, it clearly picked up the two words that are also recorded in the blues. It is worth noting that in chapter 24 of Bosch and Gagnon, it states, quote, the chamber is equipped with cameras operated from a control room, invisible from the floor of the house. The recording of the proceedings is governed by guidelines intended to preserve the concept of the electronic hazard as adopted by the House. The two words, Mr. Speaker, that were edited out of the Hansard essentially rewrote history, making the actions and procedure followed by the Speaker, you, appear proper and mine improper. As you know, I was removed from the Chamber for the remainder of the day and I was prohibited from being able to participate in debate or vote on behalf of the constituents who have sent me here. Therefore, the constituents of Lethbridge were robbed of having a presence and a voice in the House of Commons, their democratic right. It was especially egregious given the fact that there was a scheduled vote immediately following question period that day. If you go to the House of Commons site, the blues, unfortunately, are no longer available. Interesting. Which makes a person curious as to why. If you attempt to access the blues today, you will get this message, quote, Blues are available while the House is in session until the Hansard is published. The blues are taken down. Luckily, though, Mr. Speaker, for you, I kept a copy of those blues that were sent to me yesterday at the end of the day, and I have them available to submit to you here. Interesting. And I will just point out that if we flip through them on this page here, you can see my words are kindly highlighted for you. Wow. Yeah. wow. Obstruction. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we are fortunate to also have access to the audio recording, which still exists and does not lie. It's real funny, isn't it? Yeah. She is Hilarious. Serious. At pages 1228 to 1229 of the third edition of House of Commons Procedure and Practice, it states, quote, the unedited, unedited, unedited in extenso transcripts of the debates at one time produced on blue paper continue to be known as the blues. Parliamentary publications staff send to each member who speaks in the House the transcription of the member's intervention. The blues are also published on the House of Commons internal website. The availability of the blues on the House of Commons internal website permits members and their authorized delegates to use the web page or email to submit suggested changes for parliamentary publications editorial staff to consider. Members may suggest corrections to errors and minor altercations to the transcription, but may not make material changes to the meaning of what was said in the House. I'm going to read that part again because it's really important. They may not change material changes, may not make material changes to the meaning of what was said in the House. So it's interesting then that the Blues said one thing, but Hansard said another, and I did not ask for those changes to be made. The third edition of the House of Commons procedure goes on to say this. It is a long-standing practice of the House that editors of the debates may exercise judgment as to whether or not changes suggested by members constitute the correction of an error or a minor alteration. The editors may likewise alter a sentence to render it more readable, but may not go so far as to change its meaning. Editors must ensure that the debates are a faithful reflection of what was said, 
Any changes made, whether by the members or editors, are for the sole purpose of improving the readability of the text, given the difference between the spoken and written word. End quote. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, I did not suggest any changes to the officials with regard to Hansard. Hmm. Bosch and Gagnon state that the editors can make alterations but cannot make changes that go so far as to change the meaning of what was said. In the case I raised today, the significant difference in meaning without these two words, I <coughs> withdraw, being published in Hansard obviously is very significant. Yeah. On page 1229, it goes on to say, when a question arises in the House as to the accuracy of the record, it is the responsibility of the Speaker to look into the matter. In this case, the edit, otherwise known as the deletion of two very significant words, is far more noteworthy than simply improving the readability of a sentence. I believe you'll agree. The justification used by the Speaker to admonish and remove me from the chamber does not match the evidence presented in the blues and by the audio recording that you may also access. The Speaker's actions do, however, fit very nicely with the altered text published in the Hansard. Mm. On page 82 of Bosch and Gagnon, it describes a list of items to be considered a contempt. And on that list is, quote, falsifying or altering any papers belonging to the House, end quote. At page 248 of Joseph Mangon's Parliamentary Privilege in Canada, second edition, it states, quote, the House of Commons of Canada remains prepared to entertain legitimate questions of privilege where false or perverted reports of debates or proceedings are published, end quote. While this passage refers to inaccurate media reports of what was published in Hansard, it is no less offensive, and in fact perhaps more offensive, that this happened right here in the House of Commons. At pages 81 to 83 of Bosch Gagnon, it states, and I quote, Throughout the Commonwealth, most procedural authorities hold that contempts as opposed to privileges cannot be enumerated or categorized. Speaker Salve explained in, in a 1980 ruling, while our privileges are defined, contempt of the House has no limits. When new ways are found to interfere with our proceedings, so too will the House, in appropriate cases, be able to find that a contempt of the House has occurred. Just as it is not possible to categorize or to delineate every incident which may fall under the definition of contempt, it is also difficult to categorize the severity of contempt. Contempts may vary greatly in their gravity. Matters ranging from minor breaches of decorum to grave attacks against the authority of Parliament may be considered as contempts." End quote. Mr. Speaker, it cannot be debated or disputed that someone deliberately removed two words from the blues and that these two words have great significance. Mm -hmm, it cannot be debated or disputed that it therefore changed the meaning of the events yesterday and the way that they would be interpreted. Thus, resulting in an inaccurate negative reflection of me, which was then broadcasted to my constituents and to all people across Canada. Furthermore, this inaccurate account of events resulted in my wrongful dismissal from this place by you, thus robbing me of the right to represent the constituents of Lethbridge here in the House of Commons and to cast a vote on their behalf, again robbing them of their democratic right. Which leads to another aspect of privilege, and that is <coughs> improper reflections upon a member. On October 20th, 1966, the member for Edmonton Strathcona rose on a question of privilege that came out of an article in Le Droit of October 14th by Marcel Pépin. He argued that the article imputed an improper motive to him and was a gross distortion of the facts of something that occurred in the House. The Speaker ruled the matter to be, to be a prima facie question of privilege on October 24th, 1966. 
In my case, <coughs> it is the Hansard that has recorded a gross distortion of the facts, an act that can be substantiated by the Blues and the audio recordings of the procedures I referred to from yesterday, April 30th. I will give another example. On March 22, 1983, Speaker Save ruled on a question of privilege relating to false and libelous accusations against the member for Lincoln that had been published in the Montreal Gazette. The Speaker felt that a reflection upon the reputation of an honourable member is a matter of great concern to all members of the House. And the Speaker said at that time, quote, it places the entire institution under a cloud as it suggests that among the members of the House there are some who are unworthy to sit there. An allegation of criminal or other dishonourable conduct inevitably affects the member's ability to function effectively while the matter remains unresolved, end quote. Mr. Speaker, the matter I am addressing today is grave in nature and calls for your utmost attention. In summary, the matter I am bringing to your attention today has three components. One, the Speaker's ruling to expel me from the House. Two, the improper alteration of the Hansard. And three, the inaccurate reporting as to the role that I played here in this place. Mr. Speaker, if you rule this matter to be a prima facie question of privilege, I am prepared to move the appropriate motion today. I thank the Honourable Member. I thank the Honourable Member from Lethbridge for raising this matter of question of privilege. I do encourage her please to share all the information that she would like to have the Speakership to evaluate. And certainly we will take this with extreme importance. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know about you, but it seems like Greg's goose might be cooked. Even if nothing is found on him and he had nothing to do with this uh, changing of the edit or anything like that, it doesn't help his uh, lack of confidence that is already present as him being the Speaker of the House. But hey, I guess only time will tell. Love to hear from you guys. What did you think about her speech? What did you think about this whole situation? Um, let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And as always, I'll catch you guys on the next one. Thanks so much.